Okay, my name is Neil Vanikirk. I work as a wedding and portrait photographer in New Jersey, and I'm in Wayne, it's about half an hour out. And I also maintain a website. Uh, it used to be Planet Neil, but it's, uh, I changed the name over because it sounds like something that a 13 year old would maintain. <laughs> <laughs> so it's now just a tangents blog. And I post there regularly. There's, I think, at least two or three times a week that I post something, hopefully of substance. And I have a book out in flash photography, on camera flash photography, and I just finished the uh, manuscript for a new book on off camera lighting. It'll be out in April. Okay, so where do we start? Okay, so the name of the talk is just giving the f-stop, and the reason why it's called that is when people ask me questions on my website, they quite often ask for the values. They ask for numerical values, the f-stop, the shutter speed, the aperture. And I think a lot of people struggling with lighting and with flash photography, or even struggling with the basics of photography, try and break it down to numerical values. And I think they want, in the numerical values, they hope to see a pattern they, need, they might see something there that of value. The irony is that numerical values are usually irrelevant. What is far more important is the method, how we got to where we got. So the talk of the show, of, uh, the, the, the name of the talk is misleading, because I can't give the f-stop. There are too many uh, variations in the scenarios that we're gonna find, and too many changes in the lighting setups that we're gonna find, that uh, it's just impossible to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, F4, 400 ISO, that's, that's a, those are meaningless values. But the method how we get to correct exposure and the method how we get to balance flash and available light, therein lies the actual value of the information. <coughs> so let's start. <coughs> oh, I, uh, I would love to answer questions. I would like uh, if anyone is stuck somewhere please 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 ask me a question if it veers too far off track I'll make a little note of it we'll come back to it at the end of the lecture but I, I would like if anyone is just stuck somewhere just please ask me a question and we uh, try and have everyone walk out of here with uh, a little bit more the only thing that I do request is don't ask the person next to you because then you disrupt three four other people as well easiest to just raise your hand and I'll come to you so one conversation here Okay, so looking at this photograph here of brides and bridesmaids goofing around during the preparation, looking at the values here, 125th, 2.8, 640 ISO, no flash. Another photograph a few minutes later of just the bride, 250th, F4, 400 ISO. If you add these values up, you'll see that there's about a three stop difference. It's a two and a th two third stop difference. This one was flash, other one was all available light. So in other words, this was all flash. The available light was nearly three stops under. It just didn't exist in this photograph. But to my eye, this looks pretty much the same as that in terms of the direction of the light, the quality of the light, and the color. And this is what I usually aim for when I work indoors with bounce flash, that you really can't discern whether I'd used flash or not. It's just impossible to tell. In this case, it's window light streaming in, big flood of light. Here I bounce flash off to my left into the room, into the direction that I want my light to come from. I rarely bounce towards a person because that gives me flat light. I want directional light. So I bounce off into the direction that I want my light to come from. For that reason, I very rarely use a plastic, dif plastic diffuser over it. I very rarely use a stove or some kind of light, light sphere or anything like that. I approach on-camera flash photography like I would in a studio. In a studio, if I were photographing my subject, where would I put my softbox? Over here. Where I put my softbox over there. That's how where I bounce my flash. Bounce my flash over there. I have a massive softbox. Boom. Or I bounce my flash off into this direction. I have a massive softbox. Now, the reason why we bounce flash is that we're creating a larger light source. And there's a basic tenet in photography. The larger your light source, the softer the light. That's just, you can't escape from that. And this is also why I don't use a little plastic cup. You're throwing a lot of light around, dispersing a lot of light, but there's still direct light. It's still a relatively small light source, even though you're making it more or less omnidirectional. But when I bounce my flash, 
That is my light source. So the key here is that you don't think about your flash anymore as your light source. The area you're bouncing off, that is your light source. So back to the image here, large light source, and it's a flood of light coming in, and that's why it looks pretty much the same as that one. So the program today will be how to cre create soft directional light. It's pretty much just bounce flash. We're done with that section already. There's not much more to it. And then the rest is flash exposure. And for that, we have to understand how a camera shutter works. We can look at a maximum sync speed. Now, the only value that I can give you that has any worth, a fixed numerical value, is maximum sync speed. We have to know what is happening there, and we have to understand why maximum sync speed is most often a sweet spot when you work with flash. So the only numerical value I can give you is your maximum sync speed of your camera. We can look at the difference between manual flash and TTL flash. These are two entirely different beasts. Most of the explanations that I've seen in books and online forums discuss flash always in terms of as if it's manual flash, but you can't. With TTL flash, it all goes out the window. It's something entirely different because it's an automatic mode. So we have to distinguish between the two, and we'll, go, we'll cover the differences between those. We can look at dragging the shutter. It's a term that people frequently hear, and it changes a little bit with TTL flash again. We can look at the histogram, where you can actually use a histogram. And finally, just a little bit how we mix flash with tungsten light. Soft directional light, as I said, bounce flash. Create a larger light source and make it directional. We make it directional by having it off the camera's axis. We put it somewhere else. So with wedding photography and portrait photography, all my photographs tend to look like this indoors. It's a large flood of light off from the one side. What happens here now is that if you look here, you get all the detail in the dress. It's not just a flat light from the front. And one side of the face is usually better lit than the other side. And it, and it creates form and gives you texture, gives you shape and dimension to your subject. Now, in this case here, I stood on a chair over the bride, and I bounced my flash on the wall behind her. I shielded my flash with my hand so that no light reached her directly. So there's no diffuser cup, no little plastic Tupperware here. I shielded my flash with my hand, so all the light from a flash hit the wall behind her. So in this case, it mimics window light. There's no window light behind her. It was just flash bounce off the wall, but it does look like window light. And then in the way that it wraps around her, you start getting this three-dimensional effect, because it gives you form, shape, and dimension. Now, those were the days before it was very sophisticated. These days, I use a piece of black foam that I just wrap around my flash to shield my flash. Portraits inside, I take a little bit more care. Normally with a party or group of people, I'll just bounce my flash behind me and it's a flood of light. But with portraits, I take a little bit of care. If you look here, there's no light directly from my flash on the side. It's all indirect bounce off the wall next to her. Now, if you look here, you'll see that we have a cat. Oh, where did that go to? This works. Wow. <laughs> Never got it to work before. Unreal. I'm surprised. OK. Carefully aiming with my thumb, you get the catch light in the eye. The catch light in the eye is there nearly automatically, simply because you put your softbox over there. The same way in a studio, you'd have a catch light in the eye because you put your softbox at sort of a 30 degree angle higher than your subject, you'll immediately get a catch light in the eye with bounce flash. So there's no heavy shadows in the eye. Just hopping back a little bit with the idea of approaching our on-camera bounce flash like a softbox in a studio. In a studio, you'd rarely have a single light source over your subject from above. It just doesn't make sense visually. Mostly, you'll put a softbox off to the side. So this is why when I work indoors, I rarely bounce off the ceiling. It just doesn't make sense to put my light source over my subject's head. You also get top-heavy uh, top lighting with shadows in the eyes and under the chin. It's not flattering. This looks pretty awesome, just simply twisting the flash. Is this uh, TTL or manual? OK, question is, if this is TTL or manual, if I shoot on the run, I walk around and I move around, it's nearly always TTL because to take up that slack in the distance and the changes, the TTL, I let the TTL technology help me. 
I can also change my aperture and ISO and shutter speed at will without affecting it. With manual, it's more fixed. But with wedding photography, for example, if my subject is static, like the uh, family photographs, the uh, formals, then always in one position, my lights are in one position, it's just simpler to work in manual flash then. But most of the times, I just work in TTL flash. Now in this case here, I bounced my flash off to the side, but not only did I just bounce off the side, I bounced it a little towards her. Now the moment that your subject can see part of your flash tube, there's direct flash of some kind. It changes the lighting pattern. It just doesn't look pretty. So in this case, again, I shielded it with my hand so that all the light hit the wall, and that's the only light source, and then everything that spills around the room. But there was no direct flash from my camera. And these days, again, I'm a little more sophisticated. I have a piece of foam that I buy for 70 cents from Michael's art store, cut into four hair bands, and I shape it around to block the light, to shield the light. So again, all the light comes from a little bit behind, wraps around, and this side of the face is better lit than this side. And this is normally called short lighting in studio photography. The side of the face turned away from the camera is better lit than the side of the face turned towards the camera. That's short lighting. When the broad side of the face turned towards the camera is better lit, that's broad lighting. And the tendency is to regard broad lighting as a more masculine way of lighting because it creates a, a fuller figure and makes the face appear a little larger. Short lighting is a more feminine way of lighting because it, it's more slimming. It's also more dramatic, it's also more interesting. So when I work with a subject, a model or anybody or a bride, I try and aim for short lighting. I light the other side of the face more. And with that, it looks absolutely nothing like on-camera flash. There's nothing there to tell you that I used one flash on my camera. It looks like I used a softbox, a softbox or I went the whole strobus route with a little light stand and everything else to the side. Bounce flash behind me. It looks better than direct flash, for sure. This is pretty much the ugliest way that you could use flash indoors. It's soft, it's, but it's directional, and it's flat. It's not interesting lighting. Bouncing my light off to the side and a little bit behind her, I immediately get that. Far more interesting. And again, catch light in the eye, it looks great. And again, there's nothing to reveal to you that on-camera flash was used. So you really can make it look like off-camera flash. And the reason is, bounce it off somewhere else. That now becomes your light source. And by shielding your flash with a hand, a card, anything, you shield your flash, there's no direct flash from your camera, and it looks like this. Now that little bit of blue there on the side is from the available light coming in through the window. So what you saw there in that photograph is pretty much all one on-camera flash. Now to quickly run over the difference between broad lighting, short lighting, and flat lighting, give me a second. Bounce my flash off to my left, bounce my flash behind me, it's very even, but it's flat. Where it becomes more interesting is, bounce it off the other side so that the shortest side of the face is lit up. Question? Yeah. Um, can you just generally for your camera the way you work when you're aiming it? You're aiming it with basically let's see that's looking 180, so you're getting a 40. So tell you what, I'm gonna use my assistant and have her stand here and I'll show you where I would bounce my flash off. So right here. Right there is good. Now when you work with a model or a subject and you need to direct them, the easiest way to do it is to not verbally described to them because your left is their right. It becomes confusing. The easiest is to ask your subject to mirror yourself. So just move with me. There you go. Simple as that. So you use your own body and then have your subject mirror that. Now in this case, I would want to bounce my flash off to the side and a little bit behind me. So for me to light up this part of her face, I would have to hit more or less over here. So it's off to the side and a little bit behind me. So just look forward. This way, this part of her face is better lit, but then light bounces around the room, and that naturally creates a full light on this side. But this part of her face would be better lit, and this is exactly what happens there. Thank you. Was that answered? Great. It really is that simple. It's a game of billiards you're playing. We want to throw your light and have it come in. And when you shield your hand, as you say, you, you don't have any full lighting on the whole side. 
No, no direct flash from the front. Yeah, but but now it becomes tough because this was done with a 70 to 200, yeah. and I have muscles. Yes, but, but I don't. Uh, you don't, and I, I've got a tennis elbow from swinging a camera around. So what I do now is a piece of black foam that I just wrap underneath. And it should be a little more elegant than this, struggling, balancing on one foot. And this is all it does. It shields my flash from directly hitting my subject. And I can f Yeah. And then I wrap it around and fiddle around. It is not a specific size. It's just there to block enough light. People ask me what size it is. And I'm hesitant to tell them it's 6 by 7 inches. And it just happened to be 6 by 7 inches because that's a quarter of the sheet from Michael's. It's just however much I need. And I wrap it around and shape it and crumple it. The only, okay, the question is how do I balance the color temperature of the flash or the light from my flash? I gel my flash for tungsten light and when I'm working indoors. A piece of tungsten, uh, tungsten light, I use a piece of gel that I cut. I use CTS, you get CTO. A sheet of this is about $7 here at B&H. It's a lifetime supply of this gel. <laughs> cut it, piece of gaffer tape, and I keep it in position. It's not pretty, but it's functional. That works. But related to that question is, because I'm bouncing off a different colored surface, it'll pick up this yellowish cast here. And it'll pick up a different color cast depending on where you bounce your flash from, or flash off. With that in mind, you have to shoot and roll. JPEG is not an option. All the discussions you've ever seen on the forums and the magazines about JPEG versus RAW is trivial. It's RAW. JPEG is not an option. For that much control over your color balance, and exposure, everything else, you absolutely need to shoot and roll. There's no discussion. And here's a wild statement. There is no photographer on this earth good enough to get correct white balance, correct exposure, correct local contrast, correct black point, correct everything else for every possible situation you will ever find yourself in. That means you are going to edit your images. If you're going to edit your images, you might, might as well shoot and roll because you have more latitude. So if you shoot events and you shoot high volume of stuff, you need to print it out there. Shoot JPEG, that works. If you have a studio setup, we have absolute control of your color temperature and exposure. JPEG, sure, but why not RAW anyway? But I'd say that I think for pretty much any other application, you have to, have to, have to shoot in RAW, especially when you bounce flash and you pick up color casts. This may be my last question. I do Okay, the, the SP900 unfortunately has a very bad rep. And the reason is because it has the thermal shutdown. No other flash gun really has that. And the SP900 tells you when it's overheating. So some people, or a lot of people now equate this with the SP900 being a problematic camera, uh, a camera a flash gun. It isn't. It's probably the best speed light has ever, uh, not probably, it is the best speed light has ever made. I think the 582, but they don't, you, they don't tell you about it. The SP900 is the only one where it's accessible in the menu. But now a lot of people equate this with the speed light being problematic. Mine does warn me very quickly it overheats. I switch it off, disable the beep, I keep on shooting. I have to keep on shooting. For when I photograph something like a bar mitzvah or a Jewish wedding, the horror happens, that's crazy activity for three or four minutes. I can't tell my client a week later that, ah, uh, my flash didn't, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I look like an idiot. I have to keep on shooting. If the flash burns out, whether it's the SB800, 580, or whatever it might be, so be it. It is cost of doing business. Because you have to hammer your flash gun pretty hard then. So the, the SB900 is not a problematic flash. It really is a fantastic flash gun. Yes. But I've burnt out 580s and I've burnt out SP 800s. I, I'm a very, I'm very heavy on my flash guns. You don't want to buy used flash guns from me. <laughs> <laughs>
Use lenses, use cameras, yeah, but flash guns. <laughs> To me, it's very much like if you've got a car that's got a temperature gauge, or you've got a car that's got what's called an immediate light that says your car is now overheating. Either way, the temperature is the same. It's just one's giving you an indication in case something's about to happen. One says, hey, guess what? It already happened. It already happened, yeah. The same thing. Really, uh, I, I get a lot of questions about SV900. It's not a problem camera. OK, broad lighting, bounce off to that side, bounce behind me, bounce to the side, short lighting. This is well within your control from an on-camera flash just by shielding it. You have to think about the direction of the flash. There is, I call it the black foamy thing. Uh, Honol makes stuff now you can Velcro on, and there's now another one you can flex. Beautiful, awesome. Uh, I have a pile of these, and that's two hair bands that I stole from my daughter. It's really cheap. That's all of <laughs> 25 cents worth of material there. And as you can see, it's not a specific shape or size. I wrap it around it, bend it, flex it as much as I need to shield my flash. And I've had requests that I sell this stuff. I don't want to because then it becomes about the device. I mean, it really should be about the technique. It's about blocking the flash. It's, you have to think about what you want to do with your light. This is not a generic piece of tupperware you put in your flash to solve all your problems. This is a little device that you use to get us to affect a certain technique. So th that's why I don't want to sell it. It's just, it's, it's, the, it's about the technique rather than six by seven inches with rounded corners and Velcro. <laughs> but we're off on a tangent again. Oh, nice thing about this is you still look ninja super cool in black <laughs> instead of the <laughs> toilet bowl on your flash. Okay, outdoor portrait of a model. And again, soft directional light. You see the one side of the face is better lit than the other side. I'm sure if we zoomed in, we'll get the catch light and eye. It looks fantastic. It's done outdoors by bouncing my flash. In this case, it's during a workshop, we bounce a flash off glass, pillar, ceiling here. Now, what I like about working this way is I can work very fast, efficiently. I'm placing my model there, turn a little bit with me, bounce my flash there, block it. I get a portrait that looks fantastic, and I can move on. If you went the whole strobist route, you'd have your light stand out, umbrella clamp, an umbrella, and your speed light, and your meter for it. I'm already done and walked off and flirting with the model and having a great time. Now here is where the strength comes in of flagging your flash like that, and thinking in terms of your light source being something else other than your speed light. In this case, bride's prep, I bounce off the wall, other side of the bride. By shielding my flash, an equal amount of light hit her as the bridesmaid in the back, helping her get ready. The light source is now equidistant to this side of the bride and the bridesmaid. If I just used a piece of that plastic Tupperware on my flash, I'd have had a lot more light on her arm and the dress here, would have darker and I would have had weird shadows. In this case, my light source is now the wall to that side, and it's a flood of light coming in, giving equal amount of light on her and there. It really is that simple. Any questions? I, I always hover around over explaining something that looks obvious or not explaining enough. So if it, see the semaphore hand thing will suffice here. Oh, question. Yes, save me. Help me. Uh, are there any textures or colors that you can make this light up? Textures, not really. Colors. The, the real problem comes in if you have a wall that's deep green or deep blue, because then it doesn't reflect the red and yellow spectrum, which is what your skin tones mostly exist of. So then you have a discontinuous spectrum. So you have certain gaps there, so you can't really get a good skin tone. Uh, you can't really have a good color balance when you bounce off a deep green or deep blue tone. Those are the only times that I, I would go to black and white, call it art. <laughs> yeah. These are great pictures, and it's, it's really great that you're able to bounce so off. Like you have really utilized the walls around you and the space around you to bounce, uh, bounce light off of. I never thought of it that much. But let's say you're in um, a huge cathedral or a big church or something where you don't have, or tall, some place where tall, tall ceilings or, or far away walls, where you don't have that option so much to bounce 
Okay. The question is, what do you do when you can't really bounce flash a very large area? You have to start helping yourself there with high ISO capable cameras, especially if you start doing professional work, wedding photography, etc. You need to be shooting with a 5D Mark II, 1D, 1D Mark IV, Mark III, D3, D700. That's the, you have to have a high ISO capable camera where 1600 ISO is clean and you can really start pushing up to 3200 ISO. You have to have fast optics. So within that sphere of working, you need to give yourself a bit of a push over a camera that's not high so capable with a 4.5 zoom. You really need to start pushing it there. So you can often get away with shooting 600 ISO or faster with an f2.8 lens. There's a lot of light that the camera and lens then actually picks up for you. But there are times where they can't bounce flash. Direct flash. Diffuser, there's, there, there are limits. You only have so many photon, uh, electrons in your flash that it, can't, that it can convert into photons and create light. That there's a finite amount of light that that speed light can emit. So it's at a certain point, you have to start using direct flash or some other means. So you can't always bounce, but you have to adapt to whatever the situation is. There are times where I've taken the technique that you teach, and I've taken an alien bead, bounced it against the wall. Same thing. It's more power than a speed light, but it's the exact same principle. Same principle. You have a flood of light. So what he's saying there is what he's done is put up an alien B. What's it, 800 watt seconds, somewhere there, 600 watt seconds. That's a ton of light that he's kicking out, but it's a flood of light from the one side and it just really lifts the light levels up. OK, with this portrait of the bride, I was mimicking window light, as if there was a window next to her that she was sitting next to. It was a hotel room, windows off to the side somewhere there. Just there's no real space to work with air condition and everything else. Have a sit on the edge of the bed, bounce flash off to the side, shield it with a piece of black foam. So my light now floods from the wall here. There we go. And F1.8, 160th of a second, 800 ISO. 1.8 is specifically that I wanted just one area in focus, her eyes. I wanted that. <laughs> We'll continue. Do you want me to look pretty and tape it to the inside of my shirt? You don't want me to look pretty? You lady just want to see me get undressed. This makes sense. We're all happy. We're all good. And my microphone just wilted. This is going to be an issue, is it? <laughs> okay, I think we're back. Talking to the microphone. Little ring bearer again. Bounce flash off to the side. There we go. Catch lights in the eyes. Nearly guaranteed all the time, every time, by choosing a direction wisely. On camera, bounce flash again. Bounce off to the side. I have a half, at least a half CTS on, sometimes a full CTS. It's, it's a default way of working for me. In this case here, I didn't because there was red wall, red light. It just, it's a mess. So just overpower it with flash. But 99% of the times when I work indoors, I have a gel over my flash. This is automatic. The thing with you putting a gel in your flash is wedding receptions, for example. It's all a very warm spectrum. You have candles, you have little twinkly little lights, you have a video light. The venue's lights are tungsten, or these days it's fluorescent, but it's also warmish. So everything is a very warm spectrum. You're the only fool walking in there with a blue flash. Slap a piece of gel on, you join the color spectrum. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. Same thing again here, bounce light off the side with a specific idea that with this DJ, I wanted him to lift his head up like that and have the light come in on his face. <coughs> Bride and a dad walking in, I bounce my light off. You can actually see part of it there. Bounce it off this wall here so there's a flood of light from the other side and the bride and groom. So it doesn't look like flash. In this case, I did have to chase up my ISO fairly high, 2,500 ISO, in order for the flash to bounce off brickwork and get enough light on them. Again, bounce my light off there so it comes from a different direction than the camera's point of view. 
just to illustrate the power of flagging my flash and think about the direction of light here, if I had used a generic plastic diffuser on my flash, I would have lit the back of her head and arm more and her face would have been in shade because all the light would have come from this side. But what I wanted to do was have light hit her face. So in this case, I wanted my flash to bounce into the room a little bit forward from her. So the light comes from the front of her, lights up her face, and that's reflected in the mirror. So now I'm lighting up the side away from the camera more than the side turned towards the camera. And that still pretty much blows my mind that I'm able to do that with on-camera flash from here, light up the far side of somebody more than the side here. And it's simply by flagging my flash, looking at it, I want my light to come in off over there, pointing my flash there, and hitting that spot. I zoom my flash head for most efficiency. So I zoom it to 200 millimeter or uh, where the Canon goes. Where does the Canon go to? <coughs> 105. So I zoom my flash head for more efficiency. Flag it. I kind of lost my train of thought here. We flag it, zoom it, look at the direction that I want it to come from. Oh, it's also a reason why I use a piece of black foam. I want my light source to be that spot in the ceiling there. If I used a white card or something here, I would have reflected too much light into the room here and flooded her a little bit with too much light. And I want to be very specific about my light source, the position of my light. She's looking into a mirror, yes. Oh, it is a mirror. Yeah. Okay. And it was with a 24 to 70. I, I got it. Never mind. It's the same person. It's not, not, not her sister. Right, right, right. Okay. No, no, right. Okay, does it visually make sense now? Totally. Okay. To, yeah, to the right, but not just into the room here. I'm bouncing it into the corner there, forward from her so that it falls in and hits the far side of her face here, away from the camera, which is then ref reflected in the mirror. Okay, so when I first started photographing weddings eight years ago, so I, I second shot for studios, and they all said, don't use direct flash, use a little diffuser cup on the flash. And <coughs> this does look better than, uh, I don't have a diffuser cup here. That's okay. We can, we can squint and imagine one here. So instead of you photographing bride with direct on-camera flash, ugly light, chart it like this with a diffuser cup on this. Now it disperses a lot of light around, but the moment your subject can see your flash tube or that little device, there's direct flash, flash of some kind. Now if we zoom in on this shot here, we instantly see it. You get that flash shadow, you get that specular reflection of face. It's okay, but it's not wonderful. Where it becomes wonderful is when you whip out that softbox out of your pocket, and you put it up. There you go. Bounce your flash into the lobby, into the hallway. So you have a flood of light coming from that direction. And if we zoom in, that's the lighting pattern on her face. Clean, soft light, but it's still directional. I don't use a flash bracket anymore. The flash brackets were devices, a little metal device here. You unhook your flash, put it on top so that you can rotate your camera without changing your flash. So you can do a vertical shot or horizontal shot and your position of your flash remains the same, which is very useful if you have direct flash of some kind because the flash shadow will fall behind your subject now instead of to the side, which is ugly. But I don't use a flash, flash bracket anymore because I bounce my flash behind me somewhere and with a high ISO capable camera, you can bounce flash pretty much anywhere indoors now. S I shoot with a D3, 600 ISO is clean. 
I'm going to try and not to go too far over it, but 3200 is very usable. But I have 600 ISO is sort of where I start indoors. So I don't really want to take it over from, up from there. But I wanted a little bit more bite to my lens. I wanted 3.5. Why 3.5? Nah, that's what I felt like the day. Or 3.2, or 4. We, this is now a third of a stop's difference. It's incremental. incremental. It's not really huge. Difference in 2,600 ISO is also incremental. So 3.5 has a little bit of bite, 2,000. I don't even have to run noise reduction. It's still clean. And then I have a shutter speed of 80th. It works. There will be a little bit of movement and blur from the, video, from the video light and the DJ's lights. But it's all within control. But now I have to start juggling this. But it's very much dependent on me shooting with a digital camera. Because I can shoot and go, eh, and change something. And shoot and go, I rock. It, it takes a little bit of adjustment to get to the settings. But, but I wouldn't want to get too locked onto it being 80th of a second, 3.5, 2,000th. It's kind of a process to get to where I don't blur too much, I have enough depth of field, I don't have to run post, uh, uh, noise reduction or post-processing. Because ultimately I want to do as little work as possible in post-production to do the proofing. Yeah, with this, uh, I, I don't you always uh, do the noise reduction. No. I use, I use amazing noise reduction software. It's called the Nikon D3. <laughs> I, I've, I very rarely run, run, run noise reduction. You also have to think about the final use of the image. In terms of wedding photography, the wedding reception, the image is going to be a 4 by 6 at the most, or smaller in the album. It's not going to be a 20 by 30 inch enlargement, 24 inch by 36 inch enlargement. It's just not going to happen. But even then, then I would run noise reduction maybe. But I, I have... As I said, it depends on the ap application. I have a two foot by three foot canvas that I shot of a couple at 3200 ISO. I can see I can see the digital noise, but because it's a canvas texture, you don't really notice it. And the bride and the mother slipped it, and they both go, oh, "Fantastic!" So I don't get too hung up on noise reduction. And the noise reduction that I have is just the whatever the default is in ACR or Lightroom. I'm not really answering a question. Are you going shopping for a 5D Mark II or a D700? I know it. What do you shoot with? 5D. 5D. 5D is fantastic. Up to I, I, 5D, I'd shoot wedding receptions at uh, 1600. That's where I'd start. I wouldn't go really over it like you would with a 5D Mark II, but a 5D is fantastic. On a 5D? Yeah. Who's asking? Yeah. Oh, easily, easily. I've shot. Uh, <coughs> Family photographs for, for weddings, I'd, I, in a pinch, I'd shoot at 800 ISO on a 5D. That's clean. And up to 1250 is really good. And then there's sort of a jump between 1250 and 1600. But the classic 5D, 600 easily. Wedding reception, 600 is where I'd be. And it's not the old 5D, it's the classic. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so let's run over flash exposure. Your camera shutter. Now, this is something we absolutely have to understand what's happening with our shutter in a camera and how this affects flash. Now, if you have your sensor or that gate, your piece of film, what it is you have, your shutter consists of two curtains. First curtain opens, second curtain closes. The time interval between the first curtain opening and the second curtain closing that is your shutter duration. So one second will be shutter opens, shutter closes. 60th, open and closes. Now the higher you go, the shorter the interval, to the point where at 2,000th, the first curtain is still moving and the second curtain moves across. So in effect, you have a slit moving across. You have a window moving across. Is this large enough? It's kind of small here. OK, now flash, we can regard as nearly instantaneous. It's a near instantaneous burst of light. It's around about 2,000th or 1,000th of a second, depending on the design of the flash unit. So let's regard it as an instantaneous burst of light. Boom, there it goes off. You need, your, you need your window open. You need your sensor, your piece of film, completely open for that burst of light 
to expose for it evenly across the entire frame. At a high shutter speed, we have that window moving across. If your flash goes off, you only have part of the window exposed. So if you've shot in the studio, you've done this before. 60th of a second, it's well exposed across the frame. I go to 320th, which is over the maximum sync speed, and I get what is, eff what is effectively the shadow of the one shutter curtain. It blocks the flash from exposing your frame. Your continuous light is well exposed across the frame because continuous is, doesn't stop. Flash, because it's a burst, boom, only that one part is exposed. <coughs> so looking at this again, we only need our entire frame open for the flash exposure to happen. So if we worked in a dark room and then only flash exposure counts, we could have a shutter speed at two seconds, half a second, eighth of a second, doesn't matter. The bride paid a premium for this venue because it has a magnificent view of Manhattan. So we have three options here. We can expose for our background and the couple will be silhouetted. That'll be cool for one or two frames, but if you give your if you give your client 20 or 30 frames like that, you're in trouble. The other alternative is to expose correctly for them, let that blow out. It'll look cool for a high key black and white shot. Two frames, we're good. Give your client 20, 30 frames like that. Where's the magnificent view? So your only real option that you have here is to find your basic ambient exposure for your background and then dump a lot of flash to expose correctly for them. So now our flash exposure has to take place in relation to ambient. So although I said that shutter speed has no effect on flash exposure, indirectly it will detect, dictate what we do with our flash. Because a certain shutter speed will imply a certain aperture for ambient light. And that aperture has a direct influence on our flash exposure. So back of your flash, you can see a distance scale. You can only see the distance scale if your flash is forward. So this is something you can play with at home and just familiarize yourself with. Same with the Nikon. This is the SP800. Now let's consider bright daylight. Like that couple was in deep, deep shade, bright daylight. We have to expose correctly for the ambient light. If you look at this combination of settings here, 60th f22 is the same as 125th 16, 250th f11. These are all the same exposure. Your depth of field will vary, but you'll have the same ambient exposure. So let's imagine that couple in deep, deep, deep shade inside the building against a very bright background. We have to expose for the background. We can choose any combination of settings here. It'll all be good. But we only have a finite amount of power from our flash. Our flash is going to have a really hard time at f22. f16, much better. f11, even better. Difference between each of these is a doubling or halving of the amount of juice your flash has to deliver. So the difference between F22 and F11, it has to dump four times as much light to expose correctly at F22 than it would at F11. Or alternately, F11, it needs a quarter of the amount of light than it would at F22. So it makes sense to go as wide as we possibly can on an aperture. Our flash works less hard at a wider aperture. But we can't go over maximum sync speed. Because over maximum sync speed, part of our frame is obscured by the shutter curtain. In other words, we have that effect. So we have a ceiling at maximum sync speed. So when I work in bright light, I immediately go to maximum sync speed, because at maximum sync speed, I have the widest possible aperture that I can use. And the widest possible aperture implies the most efficiency from my flash, the most range from my flash, the most juice that I effectively get from my flash. It's just an automatic knock-on effect by reasoning like that. We can't go over maximum sync speed because then part of our frame is obscured. So when I work outdoors, go to maximum sync speed, find my aperture. So if it's cloudy, it'll be 250th, 5.6. But I always start at maximum sync speed. Now, a good number of years ago, the Japanese camera manufacturers came up with a great innovation, high-speed flash sync. Instead of dissipating the flash as a boom, in, uh, instantaneous burst of light, a very powerful burst of light, it disperses the flash over a longer period. It's a rapid train of pulsed light. So when that shutter curtains at 2,000 seconds move across, 
It's not like boom and only part of your frame is exposed. It goes and the entire frame is receiving flash. Beautiful, so you have even flash across the frame. But now most of your light falls on a shutter curtain anyway, so it's not efficient. You lose most of your power. So in, instead of dissipating as a one single burst of light, you're dissipating it over a longer time, and most of that light is lost against the shutter curtain. So you lose a lot of light. And if you play around with your flash, your camera in your flash, and you have it at 250th and you go one click over in above maximum sync speed into high speed sync, you'll see your flash range just drops by more than half. And so with a Canon, if you have a Canon 5D, keep it at 200th at whatever such aperture. The moment you put that little H on, you kick the flash into, you, you kick the flash into high speed sync mode. You kick it into this mode, you'll see your flash range drops by more than half. So, we can't really go up higher, higher, higher and expect to use a wider aperture and have more range from a flash. It doesn't work like that. We lose most of the light from a flash. We lose more or less two stops. There's a blog post I did last week. We lose about two stops of light. You never catch up. So you, if you work in bright, bright conditions, the best chance you have of overpowering the sun or matching the bright light is at maximum sync speed. Because maximum sync speed gives you a widest possible aperture without flipping into high speed sync mode where your flash is dissipated over a longer period. So this now becomes an automatic decision for me. You have a model, very bright light from behind coming into the room. I immediately go to maximum sync speed. Whatever my choice of aperture and ISO is, they will seesaw around my choice of maximum sync speed. Right in the vestibule with a mom, I found the exposure for the stained glass window, and I just asked her to look towards the camera, and I took the shot, TTL flash, maximum sync speed. So it's a small room, 125th, 5.6. I could have done that, very easy. 60th f8, now we're getting borderline, we're getting to small apertures. I might or might not. I'm not there to do test shots. I'm there to actually just get the shot and move on, because we're under pressure here with the wedding. So the simplest for me is to go, oh, bright background, maximum sync speed, find my aperture and ISO to balance around that. Bright background, she's in deep, deep shade. To get enough light on her, I instantly go to maximum sync speed, whatever my choice of aperture and ISO is. In this case, F4 would have been better to get a little bit more detail in the stained glass window. But at F4, I couldn't get enough light on her from bouncing my flash into the massive room behind me. I would, had, I would have had to have an assistant hold up reflector behind me, or I might have had to hold up another flash and trip with the slave as well. I need to have doubled up on the flash to get to F4 to control that. In this case, I'm not really concerned because I'm not shooting for a competition. I'm not shooting for judges to evaluate my use of light and the bright highlight there is distracting you from the bride's face. I don't really care. All I really care about is the bride go, oh, fantastic, and the bride's mom to love me. <laughs> my clients are all important, and the shot then works. Give me one second. So at F4, she was underexposed. Stained glass window is better. OK, I'll sacrifice detail in the stained glass window, saturation in the stained glass window going f2.8 to get correct exposure on her, because I am after the pretty light. Uh, there's a question in the back. OK, the question is, if I'm in shutter priority, I am nearly always in manual on my camera. And it sounds like a contradiction. It sounds like a contradiction that relies so much on TTL flash, which is an automatic metering mode, but I'm so insistent on shooting manual on my camera. And the reasoning for me is that if I shoot in program mode or aperture priority or shutter priority, there are all kinds of algorithms written into the camera depending on the light levels and which focal length and which lens and which everything else. So now my exposure, ambient exposure varies and I add TTL flash to this. So nothing is fixed. I have no idea where I am. But the moment I shoot in manual mode on my camera, boom, ambient light is fixed. And I can now add a little bit of TTL flash as full. I can match it or I can go, oh, crappy, ugly light. I'm just going to underexpose my available light and just hit it all with flash. So now it's an easier decision for me because now I only have to control my TTL flash rather than everything else. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Hang on, I need a sip of water here. It's difficult to say because not. The question is if there's a formula for figuring out how far the subject needs to be from the wall or how the ceiling or how big the room. Not really. It's something you just have to get accustomed to from shooting a lot. There's, there's no getting away from a bit of experience there. But common sense also helps. In a room like this, this is a small room. I can do 800 ISO 5.6 easily. But this is not 100 ISO F8 on a little speed light bounce. It's just not going to do it. If we're out in bright sunlight, that's not F1.8. If we walk out in bright sunlight, that's 250th F1100 ISO. That's, that's what it is, sunny six in rule. Walk indoors, you're at F4, you're at 3.5, you're at 800 ISO, somewhere there. You have to start guiding your settings more or less to what really makes sense. So if I walk outside, I immediately, before even thinking, 100 ISO to 50th F11, or somewhere there. If I walk indoors and I know I'm going to take a photograph, 1000 ISO, 3.5, 60th, whatever I feel like today. Which comes back to this directly here, manual flash versus TTL flash. Okay, manual flash, how's this microphone doing? Still behaving? Oh, there it is. Okay, manual flash. Your flash gun, or your strobe, or your monolight, or whatever you have in the studio, gives you a fixed output. Boom, it gives you a certain amount of juice. Tiny little speed light will give you a fixed amount of juice, but less. But it never varies. So let's consider working in the studio, or even outside on location with manual flash. Gives you a certain amount of light. Now manual flash, four things control the power there. Aperture, ISO, distance, and the actual Sorry, let me repeat that. Four things control the flash exposure. Aperture, ISO, distance, and power. These things should make sense if we think about it. Let's say we're working in a studio. Here we have a big octobank, octodome, with a studio light of some kind, put it up, put it up here. The distance to my subject will influence my exposure. If I move this thing closer, it'll be brighter. I move it further back, it'll become more and more dim. So it's just, I think it's common sense Distance will have a large impact or will influence our flash exposure. We choose 200 ISO, 800 ISO, 100 ISO. This will directly influence our exposure, just the sensitivity of our sensor. Same with aperture. Small aperture, F11, F4, big change in exposure. So it's just, I think it's common sense. This, this, this will affect our flash exposure. And as well as power, where we're dumping full power, half power, quarter power, eighth power, whatever it is that we set now power pack. So for this distance, I need my camera at a certain ISO, at a certain aperture, for a certain power setting. Now, TTL flash, or order on your camera, it's a dramatic metering mode. The amount of light reflected from your subject will influence your metering. So for example, you're photographing somebody with a dark shirt against a dark wall, same amount of light falling on me. I have a white shirt against the white wall, same amount of light falling on me. Your camera's meter will tell you, ooh, lots of light reflected, we have a lot of light. We need to close down to F8. Dark shirt, dark background, your camera says there's not enough light, we need to open up to F4. Your camera's meter is now being fooled by the reflectivity of your subject. The tonality of your subject is now affecting your metering. For this, we need to have a handheld meter and go, oh, we have this much light, or use a histogram, or have some other kind of way of determining our exposure and fix it. Because our automatic mode will be fooled by the reflectivity of our subject. Now, back to TTL flash. So is everyone happy with manual flash that these four things control exposure? OK, with TTL flash, it all goes out the window. OK, let's go over an example here outside. Balancing flash and ambient light. They, they, without flash, they would be underexposed. I need to find my basic settings. 
Now it sounds like we have a whole bunch of things here, aperture, ISO, shutter speed, distance, and it all, it's a, it's a mess. But it's not. Usually they all fall into place one after the other. Even though the sun is going down, it's still very bright. I'm immediately at 100 ISO. I don't need to be at 600 ISO for this photograph. 100 ISO is good. Very bright light, I need to balance flash in bright light. I go to maximum sync speed. Because maximum sync speed will give me my widest possible aperture. And in that aperture, my flash will work less hard. It will work less hard at 5.6 than it would at f22. So I choose a higher shutter speed. But I can't really go over maximum sync speed. Because then I go into high speed sync mode. Flash is dissipated over a longer period. My range drops. OK, so I have 100 ISO. I have maximum sync speed. So for the ambient light, ambient light, shutter speed, aperture, ISO. Three controls. It's always been, always will. Shutter speed is fixed. ISO is fixed. All that I have left is aperture. I now need to find my aperture to give me a decent exposure. Now we have a bit of play here. F5 look good. I have nice saturation. Looks dramatic. Somebody else shooting next to me would have chosen F4, F8. It doesn't really matter. Now becomes your choice. So now shutter speed is fixed. ISO is fixed for me as well as aperture. Manual flash in a softbox there. My assistant is holding up a softbox. Manual flash is controlled by aperture, ISO, distance, and power. Aperture is fixed for me at f5 because aperture is fixed for me at f5 because of what I want to do with the available light. ISO is fixed for me because of what I want to do with the available light. So all that I have left is distance and power of my flash. So my assistant's holding up a softbox. We decided on half power on the speed light. It's going to be a problem for me to tell her to drop it down, change it, pick it up, etc. So it's simpler for me to take the shot, look at my LCD, and go, ah, uh, get a little closer. She was a little closer, I did another test shot. So this way I control my distance. Ideally, I would have had a hand held meter there and go and go five, five for that power. You can do it by cheating a little bit, by just looking at LCD and uh, give every established old photographer steeped in tradition, give them a heart attack. Digital works, you can, you can cheat, look at the LCD. Or hand held meter or look at the histogram. However it is, you get your good exp uh, proper flash exposure. Distance, power, ISO, aperture. Now with TTL flash, it all goes out the window. Your camera and flash will automatically change your power to compensate for a change in ISO or aperture or distance. In other words, your camera will follow whatever your settings are. It will change the power. So in other words, if I bounce my flash, photograph him at f4, go to 5.6, my flash will just dump more power to give me correct exposure. So in other words, you could change your aperture and ISO and your TTL flash exposure will look the same because your camera and flash are adjusting the output to give you the same re exposure regardless of your chosen aperture and ISO. In other words, if I had a softbox here, manual flash, I have good exposure on my subject at f5.6. If I want to go to f4, I'm going to overexpose by a stop. I now have to drop my power or change my ISO, I have to do something else to change that. So now there's a knock-on effect. If I change one thing, I have to change something else. With TTL flash, my camera automatically controls the amount of power my flash gives out at 5.6. I go to F4, it'll give me less power. I go to 2.8, it gives me even less power for the same exposure. So it's less work for me. Here's an example. I bounce my flash into this room, into the ceiling, TTL flash. One twenty-five, two point eight, eight hundred ISO. Why did I decide on that? I felt like it. <laughs> I get good exposure on my subject. It all works. The TTL flash exposure work for it. Now because she's wearing a white shirt, that will influence my exposure metering. So I was probably at plus one flash exposure compensation. One stop more light than the camera thought I need. Because the camera sees 
a lot of white there and it says, uh, gives me a little less power than it than I really need. So I need to tell it to give me more, one stop more. I, I use matrix metering on my camera or evaluative on the Canons. I rarely deviate from it. We'll get to, we'll get to that as well the, afterwards. In the end, for ambient light, your metering pattern has no effect on your exposure. 1 to the 4th f4 is 1 to the 4th f4, regardless of whether it's a spot meter or evaluative or center weighted. These are desperate times. <laughs> I'll come back to the metering pattern, but ultimately it doesn't really affect what we're doing. Okay, 125th, 2.8, 800SO, TTL flash. How did I calculate my flash exposure? I didn't. I let the technology take care of it for me. But I did need to crank up my flash exposure compensation. I told the flash to give me more juice than it thinks I need because of the white. The white reflects a lot of light. My camera says, oh, too much controls the power down. I say, no, 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 give me a little bit more power. I want, I want that extra power. Now, what would happen if I changed to F4? Nothing. It'll compensate. It'll follow whatever I'm doing. If it was manual flash, it would be underexposed by a stop, but it's not. It's TTL flash. In fact, in this case, I jumped to 5.6. The exposure between there and there is the same on her. The amount of light that wraps around from behind changes. The ambient light changes. But the basic exposure on her from the TTL flash didn't change because my flash followed my settings. I dumped four times as, amount of, four times as much light at 5.6 than it at 2.8. <coughs> but the exposure didn't change. Now with manual flash, I would have had to juggle something else. Change my ISO, change the power, a whole bunch of stuff. So. I most often work with TTL flash when I shoot fast because the technology helps me. It gets me there faster. But I do have to control it, and it's not predictable. But the strobus guy, get, a, get out his little light stand, umbrella clamp, umbrella, speed light, pocket wizard, pocket wizard, meter. I'm already done. <laughs> Let me just finish this section, and I'll come back to you. OK, now, what happens here? Flash exposure on her remains the same, but the background changes. This is now counterintuitive to everything you, are, you have ever been taught about flash. With flash, they always tell you, aperture controls flash. No, it didn't. The aperture changed my background light, the ambient light. It did not change my flash. OK, you've been told, aperture controls flash, shutter speed controls available light. In this case, it didn't, because I shot with VTL flash. TTL flash is not manual flash. You have to make a complete distinguish, uh, completely distinguish between those two. Two different beasts. OK, so whenever you see on the forums the books Aperture Control Flash, you have to know that they're talking about manual flash. Because of the TTL flash, it simply isn't true. The flash dumped four times as much power, but still gave me great exposure. In this case now, I can take my shutter speed up again to get my background even larger. So if I wanted to control my background exposure, traditionally, I would change my shutter speed. It's just simpler. But you can do it with aperture and ISO at will, because your camera and flash will follow whatever you're doing. When you're calculating on the TTL, is it taking the direct uh, lighting, or is it calculating the reflection as well? How does it know? Okay, T TTL flash. Let me just hop out to this to the previous slide. TTL flash is calculated on a pre flash. Before your main exposure happens, there's a pre flash that it emits. It's a little blip of light. And the amount of light that's reflected, your camera will now say, Oh, I need to dump this amount of light. You can actually see the pre flash. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, I'm going to go to a one second exposure here just to illustrate. F4, dun, 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 dun. here's the TTL flash exposure. We're seeing the pre flash and the main burst. 
all together. They're so close together, you can't distinguish it. If we, but this is now with a flash timed to the first curtain opening. If we now time the flash to the second curtain closing, it looks like this. Pre-flash, main burst. So there's two distinct things happening there. And the TTL flash is calculated with that pre-flash burst. And the amount of light re that returns, the camera says, oh, we got to dump a lot of juice to give us correct exposure of 5.6, whatever it might be. That's why I like it. It's, I can concentrate on the photography. Hang on a second. You had a question as well. Good question because you, you bumped up the, the flash a little bit because she was wearing a white shirt. Now let's say you have a bride and groom standing next to each other. One's wearing white, one's wearing black, most likely. Do you compensate for that at any point? Or do you at that point, I'm shooting manual flash with a soft box or an umbrella. Flash uh, with the umbrella is the same distance to them. Now, now I can add five groomsmen all in black, or I can wear, uh, I can put a bride all in white or a mixture of, the exposure now doesn't change because distance remains the same, aperture, ISO, everything else remains constant. That is absolutely a time I would shoot in manual flash. But if I shoot a few quick portraits of the bride, let's say the limo is outside but we've got another five minutes to the hotel lobby. It's a question of stand here, look this way, boom. Let's move over here, boom. Let's do this, I move closer, I move further away. And then it becomes easier for me to shoot with TTL flash, especially if I use on-camera bounce flash because I'm moving closer. Oh, hang on, I want to blur the background, f2.8, boom. Oh, she wants a photo off of her and her sister quickly. Oh, you know what, I need f4 for a little more depth of field, f4, boom. The camera now dumps, uh, the camera now tells the flash to dump more light to get me f4. So then it's easier for me to work with TTL flash. But the scenario you mentioned, groom and bride, and this and that, mix it up, manual flash is absolutely the way to go, even if I shoot on camera flash, manual flash bounce behind me. I'll make sure that I stand in the same position and I pose them in the same spot. Then I make sure that my position to them doesn't change. Otherwise we start juggling compensation too much and it becomes a mess. Does that answer your question? With manual, if I'm going to put power, I know that I can't go anymore. I'm giving it everything. Yeah. With when you're running up against that wall or close to it, how do you know that, hey, I better be aware I can't go too much further? There is you, you don't, you don't. The, the question is, when do you, how do you know you've reached the edge of what TTL is capable of? You don't. Sometimes when I need to dump a lot of light, like that bride with the stained glass windows behind her, it's simpler there to go to manual flash, full power, boom. Oh, I can't do it at four, two point eight, boom, got it. Sometimes I just cheated in TTL. I crank it to tell me, give me three stops more than what you think you, I need. It's going to dump everything it has. That's the same as full power. Although sometimes if you're in evaluative mode, um, t metering in your Canon flash or TTL BL, it'll still have a little bit in reserve because it always tries to do it in relation to what the ambient exposure is. But I most often then just crank it up to plus three stops and just dump everything it have, has, which is usually equivalent to full power. There's no real way of knowing. But in that case, it's simple to go to manual full power and go, oh, I can't do it. I need to change aperture, ISO, distance, something. When you make the exposure compensation adjustment, are you doing that on the camera body or on the flash? Okay, flash exposure compensation, do I do it on the camera or the body? It depends on what camera system you use and what camera you have. Okay, Nikon D3, D2X, you can only change on the flash, it doesn't have it on the body. Although, I shoot in manual mode on my camera. The overall compensation also changes the flash. So I sometimes change my flash compensation on my body by changing my overall compensation. It's cumulative. If you shoot with a Nikon D700, D300, everything else, the flash exposure compensation is flash on your body and overall compensation. It's cumulative. In theory, you should be able to bump this up two stops, bump that down a stop, bump your flash compensation down a stop, and it'll be zero. It's cumulative. That's the theory of whether that works in practice exactly like that. Who knows? So it is a matter of what is ergonomically easier for you. With a Canon 5D, for example, this little, this little finger, 
does 90% of the work on the 5D. Ergonomically speaking, the 5D is, is hard. And then I found it easier just to dial it on the flash. It just takes a little bit of stress off this. The Canon is also, older models, whether you dial it in your flash or your body, the one overrides the other. I can't remember which one overrode the other. It's then simpler just to work with only the one. Keep the flash at zero, change the body, or keep the body on the flash exposure comes at zero, change the body. On the Canons, if you shoot in manual, your overall compensation is disabled. You can only do flash exposure compensation whether on the flash or on the body. With Nikon, you can still adjust overall compensation, and that's cumulative. The newer Canons, as far as I know, if you adjust it on the flash, it changes the similar on the body, or on the body does the same on the flash. There's no clash like it used to be on older models. With a 1D Mark III, it was easier for me to have the thumb on the compensation and just do the little thumb wheel. It was easier for me to do it on the body than the flash. So ultimately it is whatever is ergonomically easier for you, but keep it consistent. That was the long answer. Short answers, do what you want, man. <laughs> okay, are we, are we good on this one? The TTL flash, how it differs from manual? And what I want to emphasize here is that with TTL, we need to disconnect ourselves from the manual flash mindset. Aperture controls flash exposure. That's only true for manual flash. TTL flash, it's not true. And there it is. And you can try it for yourself at home. Photograph a relative or a kid or even a teddy bear in a bar stool. Bounce your flash. Go to 2.8, f4, 5.6, f8. All the exposures are the same because TTL fla flash follows what we're doing. Uh, that's very good. But another question is that now you use a light meter that is across to you, that, you know, that is bright, white dress. What if I use smart meter and look at the, the bright white dress and then I have the end Yes. Hang on, it's coming up in two minutes. OK, so back to the TTL metering. Here it is. Piano player in a venue in Brooklyn, Manhattan skyline. I find my basic ambient exposure. I expose correctly for the background. And then I just bounce flash into the room. Photograph the bride and groom under a very tall veranda. Now my settings here, 1 20th of a second, 2.8, 1250 ISO. And the reason why I'm at such extreme ends, very low shutter speed, very wide open aperture, very high ISO, is because I want to retain the last bit of ambient light, the evening sky setting. So if I change my settings away from that, it would have been pitch black behind them, but I want to retain some of the mood. No. <laughs> I've, used a, I've used a tripod once in the past five years for at weddings. It's just, I, I, paid a, I paid a ton of money for that vibration reduction and stabilized lenses. It better work. Now, the reason also is why I don't need it is the flash will freeze the action or freeze the camera shake. Combined with stabilization, combined with locking in, stabilizing myself, locking my elbows, resting the camera and squeezing off the shot, you can get away with it. Now in this case, 1250 ISO, I'm going to zoom in. This is with a 1D Mark III. There's no noise. There's no noticeable noise. No noise reduction. Whatever the default is in ACR, that's what it was. Canon 5D would look like this. It's, it looks really good. So this is, this is TTL? TTL flash. So for absolute flash issues like me, what's promising about this, seems helpful about this, is if you know how to do an exposure for your ambient light and bounce it, throw that flash where you want, camera's going to decide, and if it's too bright or too dark, I'm going to use a flash exposure compensation. Nudge it down, nudge it up. That, exactly. It's ambient, and I get It's great. It's, it's, it is that simple. Yeah. It, it really is that simple. There we go. Find my basic exposure of the background. Boom, add flash. I'm good. If it's a little over, nudge it compensation down. A little under, nudge it up. Right. And, and for, the, for the very last shot that you showed us, so it's just based on you wanted that last light. Simplicity itself. Yeah. 
And then if I shoot too fast and the flash can't keep up, I get that. It still works. There is camera shake. There is movement. This happened to be the bride's favorite shot of the day. I just didn't tell it as an accident because, <laughs> because I want to maintain the illusion that everything out of my camera is, a deliberate, is deliberate and is a masterpiece. <laughs> but there you go. But there's, there's definite camera shake and movement there. However, this is going to be this big an album. And it's all about the mood and the moment. And she loves it. I'll take it. But it works because I expose for the background. So in this case, the silhouette shot works. Now, when I work with a couple or a model, my choice of background, my choice of lighting, choice of direction of light is all very deliberate. The way that I frame the shot, what I include, what I exclude, all of this is important. It's not just random. So in this case, I want to photograph the bride and groom against these twinkly lights outside. And then I bounce flash off the side of the reception venue. And there we go. I am at 1600 ISO on the D3. There's no noise. I could remove a bit of glare with uh, Shine Off, a nice plugin for Photoshop. Could use a little bit of sweetening still, but there's no noise. With a high ISO capable camera, the noise just, it's not a problem anymore. F2, I did need a wider aperture because I'm bouncing flash off the side of the venue and I have to have enough light return on them to light them up against the background. So this is the same shot as a piano player. I find my background exposure and then, boom, dump enough light on them from the flash. It's the same shot as this. Find the background exposure, dump enough TTL flash on them. It becomes this easy. No, uh, in, 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 in this case, in this case here, I, I need to, to, I need three, maybe four setups for the bride and groom outside. So while they're having dinner, I go outside and go, huh, I'm in trouble. Hang on, if I move here, I've got trees, I can have them stand there, and I can use that building there, and I do a test shot. So. I figure it out, and then I find another spot, and then I find another spot. So when I do walk outside with a couple, they want to get back in the party, they want to dance. Okay, it's right there, kiss, cuddle, test shot, test shot, okay, great, just play with it, got the shot, let's move on to the next spot. So these are all very deliberate. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. The framing, the composition, everything is very deliberate. Exposure of the background, deliberate. Direction of light, it's very deliberate. And knowing you'll have a spot to Yeah, but in, in this case, I can't, I can't use Twinkly lights in that tree. I can't use twinkly lights in that tree. Uh, hang on. If I have them stand here, I can use. I can. Yeah, I can use that wall. Yeah, great. So I, I choose. I choose the same way. Right in the beginning, I had that model. The, the model on the bookmark. It's not just ran. I don't just have a randomly stand outside. I have a stand uh, stand outside right next to the path station where I have something to bounce off. It becomes the de deliberate positioning of my subjects. I find the spots. Does that answer your question? No, no. No. Uh, because you're in the, the other couple was in the um, forest. Uh, there was no, yeah. Them. Cool. No, hang on a second. This, this is under a tall veranda. It's an old historic building. It's a tall veranda, about twice the height of this that we stood under. <laughs> it's a double positioning. I knew that, oh, you know what? I got something to bounce off here. I got, yes, I have a cool background here. We can work here. It's deliberate. It's not just out of all the hundreds of places around the building that I could have shot in, I pick four or five. Because I have a cool background, I can bounce my flash right here, and then we work somewhere else. So it, it becomes deliberate. Can you bounce off a tree if there's nothing there? Or do you I have. To I have. And it's on my computer, but it's not a really good shot. And I still, as I said, I want to maintain the illusion that everything out of my camera is always a masterpiece. <laughs> they look like Martians. Green, green, green. <laughs> However, however, I shoot in RAW, click on the white lapel, and it, uh, it looks good. I have done that. What about reflectors? Did you tell you that you could use that? You could. Well, you yes. You. Yes, but I, I'm, I'm inherently very lazy, but I'm also inherently very cheap. I'd rather work on my own and look for the carport and, or look for the room than pay an assistant to hold a reflector.
Now you hear all about all my bad qualities as well. <laughs> yeah. No, you can. A reflector would work. But most often I work on my own, and then I have to innovate and find spots and positions that work. Is somebody else here with a question? On the, on the next uh, picture, do you remember what kind of focal length? Not the next one, the, the one on the right. It was the Nikon 85 1.4. That's 85. Now back to the idea of deliberately positioning my subjects. Brian and Groom, they originally didn't want photographs in the church. So I didn't have my light stands or the quantum lights and umbrellas there. So we did the bubbles and champagne and everything outside and they said, oh, they want a few photographs inside the church. And I'm like, oh, okay, now you tell me. And here I cheat again a little bit by, by where I deliberately position them. Instead of taking them all the way up to the front of the altar, they just want a photograph of themselves within the ambience, within, within the context of the church. So I have them stand right in the front, near the entrance. I've got a wall behind me. Bounce my flash on, on the wall behind me. And I just get my basic exposure for the background, bounce my TTL flash, I have good exposure on them. So this is the same photographs, the piano player, and all the other examples. I find my background exposure, find a place to bounce flash off, and that automatically exposes correctly for them. Either you answer it or I do. <laughs> okay, let's get back into it. Now, a lot of what I do with flash relies on the ambient exposure. It's not just flash doing all the work. It's flash sometimes riding on top of the basic ambient exposure. In this case here, I found my basic exposure, 123.5 thousand ISO, could have been 800 ISO. And 800 ISO is not a high ISO anymore. 800 ISO is 10 years ago, 200 ISO. 800 ISO is right now is like a medium ISO. It's nothing extravagant. Okay, 125.5 thousand ISO, that looks cool. So I bounced my TTL flash into this venue here, off there. It's just a flood of light that returns. That bit of TTL flash on top of this ambient light gives me this exposure. How much flash? I don't know. But I did give myself a helping hand here by raising my ISO a little bit. 3.5 is useful. It does it. This way I can shoot very fast with a couple because the limo is on time, uh, is, is on our timer. We, we got to get stuff done here and I have to get a whole variety of photographs within the museum here where they had a couple. Now there's an interesting side effect here that I want to show. And in the little handout I gave, there's two little example photographs. And I think once I explain it, and you have, have the visual confirmation of it, it's something that will absolutely make sense. This is one of those aha moments. Where's my light source? This here. It's not my on-camera flash. This is my light source. My light source is now equidistant to my foreground and my background, which means I have the same exposure on my foreground as on my background. Now, normally, if you have flash and you shoot forward or you bounce the ceiling, your background becomes progressively darker because there's light fall off. In this case, if I bounce light behind me or into the ceiling or direct or whatever I had, or even umbrella, there would have been light fall off to the background. The background would have become progressively darker. But not here, because I bounced off an area, same distance from everyone. So the distance from my light source to the foreground is the same distance as my light source to the background. Therefore, I have consistent exposure throughout. I like that. <laughs> One out of 65 people, I'll take it. <laughs> okay, here it is again. Uh, mariachi. How do you pronounce it? Mariachi or Mariachi? Mariachi. I'm not from here. Um. <laughs> that's, that's America. Everyone's from somewhere else. Okay. Uh, guitar player in a Mariachi band. I wanted light evenly across everyone in the, in the band. At f2.8, I don't need everybody else sharp. I need him sharp. That's it. Bounce flash off the stone brick wall, the brick wall behind, behind me. Equidistant to the foreground and the background, I have even light throughout. Does this make sense? Yeah. In case it doesn't, here it is again. Dancing, foreground, background, evenly lit because I chose a spot in the ceiling to bounce off. There's equidistant foreground to background. 
instead of sitting in Photoshop and using, I, I don't even use it anymore, so I don't even remember it, with uh, dodging and burning my photo off to make certain areas lighter and brighter. I don't have to do it. I'd rather get it at the time of shooting it and spend a lot of time in Photoshop afterwards. Here it is again, foreground and background, nearly evenly lit. She's like half a stop under. I can send this out in proofing without even bringing this into Photoshop. Because the more time I spend in Photoshop, the slower my workflow. I just want to do everything in Lightroom or Bridge or whatever, or whatever your choice of raw conversion software is. The moment I open Photoshop, I lose time and slow down. It's got to be a very quick edit. To select and clean up the photo for exposure and white balance. Anyway, foreground, background, nearly equally well lit because I chose a spot in the ceiling over there that is the same distance from foreground to background. Here it is again. Foreground, background, evenly lit. This is, this is a massive aha moment. Uh, for me, anyway. OK, let's see how we're on time. And let's see where we are in the program. We're running a little bit behind. How, much, how long can we go on today? Five. Only 5 o'clock? And then we have to get out of here, or we can linger? We can linger until they throw us out. After party across the road. <laughs> OK. Let's see how it all com comes together, this balancing of flash and available light. And it, at some level, you have to become accustomed to the controls of your camera. It has to become fluid. OK. Basic exposure on my bride is good, using the histogram method, metering with a white, handheld meter, whatever it is you would choose. Exposure on them is good, 125th F2, 1000 ISO. If you're standing next to me, you would have had a different combination of settings, but same overall exposure. Exposure on them is good, but I lose all context. It just, it's very bland. The sky is blown up. It's just not interesting. I pull the exposure down so that I get blue sky, get detail. I retain more of the mood. That's great. The silhouette shot works, but ideally I want a little more detail in them. There we go. I bounce flash off the side of the building there to get enough light on them. Now, how I got from here to here is partly a deliberate decision, partly just, hey, whatever happens. So here it goes. Aimbit exposure is controlled by aperture, ISO, shutter speed. Always is, always will be. So to bring my ambient exposure down, I can raise my shutter speed, close my aperture, drop my ISO. I know I'm going to use flash. So the first thing I do is change my shutter speed from 125th to 250th. That'll drop my ambient light by a stop. Why not over 250th? because we've got a high-speed sync, and I lose efficiency from my flash. i got to be at maximum sync speed. And by the way, if I say 250th, Canon people with a 5D, you hear 200th. D80 people, you hear 180th. you got to hear the appropriate shutter speed. It's maximum sync speed. OK, so I dropped my shutter speed by the stop, 250th, boom. I could have dropped my aperture or my ISO or both. In this case, I decided to drop my ISO. That's what I felt like that day. So why did I go from 1,000 to 320 ISO? It sounds pretty random, and it is. There's a 1D Mark III, I hit the ISO button, and I flicked that wheel. The roulette spin of the wheel, and the lucky number was 320. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no aha moment here. This, this, is, this, is, this is a ha-ha moment. OK, so the maximum sync speed thing is a del deliberate decision. The other one is a moment of desperation. I need to drop something. How much? I don't know. Flick it. Take a shot. I rock. This works. <laughs> OK. I could have dropped my ISO, could have dropped my aperture, could have dropped a combination of the two. If 320 was not a good place to be, I could have gone up, gone down, changed my aperture, whatever it might be. The shutter speed is very specific. And then I bounce flash off the side of the wall there, and I get a shot that I particularly like. Retains the mood, gives enough light on them. OK, dragging the shutter. Shutter speed has no effect on flash exposure while we remain at or under maximum sync speed. So let's imagine we're a winning photographer in 1985, big hustle blood, bracket, luminine flash, big battery pack, dressed like a penguin. <laughs> Manual flash, four controls. Aperture, ISO, distance, power. If you're standing at the front before the bride comes down the aisle, 
So you set your power pack to quarter power. Back of the flash there's a little spinny dial and you go quarter power. You've loaded 400 ISO film in your back, so your ISO is fixed, 400 ISO, quarter power, and you're going to ask the bride and dad to stop at about 15 feet. So at 15 feet, 400 ISO, quarter power, I need to be at 5.6. So you dial your camera to 5.6 and you pre-focus to 15 feet. Shutter speed didn't come into this yet. The shutter speed is not affected. A flash exposure is not affected by a shutter speed. So Brighton Dad comes down the aisle. We can now shoot at 500th of a second, 250s. 125, 60th, 30th. If you shoot indoors in a church at 500th of a second, there's no background, it's black. We have no context, it looks ugly. We take our shutter speed lower, 250th, 125, 60th, 30th. Now the ambient light starts to register, 15th. So depending on the amount of light in the church, how comfortable you are hand-holding this and how large you're going to blow the photograph up, you can choose a 30th of a second or 15th of a second. So your ISO is fixed, aperture is fixed because of using manual flash. The only control you have, independent, is shutter speed. So you drag your shutter speed to bring it lower, to bring the ambient light in. That's the way it was in 1985. Now we shoot TTL flash with digital cameras and we can change our ISO where we want to be. So in, to bring the ambient light in, I don't drag the shutter down, 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 down. I go the other way. Same idea. I go f1.8, 1600 ISO. The reason why I'm at a very high shutter speed for indoors, 160th of a second, that's very fast for indoors. The reason why I'm at that high shutter speed is I often work next to a videographer with a big light. If I shoot at 30th and 15th of a second, I get movement and blur. If that's what you like, knock yourself out, go for it. Artistic interpretation, it's your thing. I like sharp. I need to be at a, oh, not used to this. I need to be at a high shutter speed. So I go 1.8, 600 ISO. This is now the opposite way of working. Instead of pulling the shutter speed low, 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 I take the shutter speed up, 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 because I want sharp. But I can't have detail in the background at a fast shutter speed at 5.6, 400 ISO. I now have to move to other things. TTL flash will follow whatever your settings are. So I find some exposure that I'm happy with the background. 1.8, 600 ISO, and then I find a shutter speed where it all works and balances. There you go. So I now drag my shutter, I get that ambient light in, by going wide in my aperture, going high in my ISO, because I shoot TTL flash. I have the control open to me. Here again, 200th of a second, very fast for indoors. F1.6, 1600 ISO. I quite often shoot at an angle to the videographer, and that's the rim light you see on the couple. Getting a bit of rim light there. My choice of settings are chosen such that there's detail in the background, there's ambience, there's context, and then I use bounce flash, gel for tungsten. And I only really need one thing in focus, the bride's eye closest to the camera. That works, I've got the mood. So dragging the shutter, manual flash, you always think about bringing your shutter speed low, 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 low. With TTL flash, change whatever you please, you have my permission. <laughs> Okay, using a histogram. I use my histogram most often when I work with a constant light source, whether it's manual flash or ambient light. You can't use it for TTL flash because TTL flash varies according to your composition. So here it is. Your histogram shows whatever your sensor can capture. At that point, it's the darkest point. This is your brightest point. Beyond this, you've fallen off the edge of the world. You have nothing. You've lost it. So what I do is I use my histogram to determine my, bright, my exposure according to my brightest relevant tone. So with weddings or portraits, somebody wears a white shirt, I try and have the brightest part of my subject dip right into the corner. Then white will appear as white. I won't lose detail, but I also won't be underexposed. So this is how I use the histogram. The shape of the histogram will change depending on composition. You've seen if you photograph stuff in the same light, your histogram does all kinds of stuff. So there's no real information that you can glean from your actual shape of your histogram. That point there is all important. If I can place my brightest relevant tone there, I have perfect exposure. If I spike, I have overexposure, it starts flattening out. 
Canon, I take it just short of that edge. This is not a secret little note that I got from Chuck Westfall. This is just what I figured out from shooting repeatedly with Canon. If I uh, have a subject with white, and I dip it just short of that corner, with Canon you've got these five bars there, sort of about a third way in from the edge. Perfect exposure if you work with white. Photograph somebody on the beach. Do a close-up of the white t-shirt, get your histogram there, pull back. Now your sky and everything else that affects your exposure doesn't because you fix your exposure depending on your brightest part of your subject. Overexposure starts spiking. Underexposure looks like this. Now your noise resides in your shadow areas. You can pull your exposure up but at the same time you also pull up your shadow areas and therefore you pull up your noise. So the best thing you can do to control your noise is to expose correctly at the time of taking the photograph. So that's how I use my histogram to determine my exposure, which comes back to questions somebody asked. Okay, metering. Your camera tries to take for everything is gray. If you have a subject with a white shirt against a white wall, same amount of light, your camera will take it to gray. If you have the same amount of light, somebody in a dark shirt, dark wall, your camera will say, oh, not enough light, we'll open it up, we'll take it to gray. You have to control your exposure, and that, with that, you can either do comp exposure compensation in auto mode or in manual, just meter correctly and place your subject where it needs to be. In program mode, I look at white, it clumps in the middle. What I'm after is it needs to be right on the edge there in manual. Canon, in program mode, pointing it just to white, your camera takes it to gray. It looks ugly. You need to push it up, oops, right to the edge. And you, I do this by metering off my white with my brightest relevant tone. Depending on your camera system, it's either one and two thirds stops or five clicks up from zero. You need to force white to be white instead of gray. With a D3, I'm most often at one stop only. So each camera make and model varies a little bit. The Canons are fine, it's usually five clicks. In other words, five thirds of a stop, one and two thirds of a stop up from zero. Uh, this is stuff that I really expand on in my book. I think quite a few of you have the book. It's also stuff that's on my website, the Tangents blog. It's explained there in detail. But the idea is that I meter selectively and I place a certain tone in a specific spot on my histogram. Blinking highlights. My histogram will now spike because of this and that. Now I can't use my histogram to determine exposure. I have to come in close on just my subject and then I can look at the shape of my histogram. Same there. The histogram is spiking. I can't. From this, I can't tell what's happening with my exposure. I need to take a photograph of just that white and look at my subject. I can't include my background. So here it is in effect. A meter of the white, place this in my histogram, pull back. TTL flash, minus a third of a stop. Whatever happens to the brighter areas, I have no interest in. I'm not a landscape photographer, I'm a portrait photographer. I've determined my basic exposure, touch a full flash, and there we go. <laughs> Through my camera metering, I come in real tight, just on the white. Your camera will take everything as gray. Your camera will do that. Uh, doesn't work. What I want to do is I want to place that brightest part there on the edge. With a Canon 5D, I would take it up five clicks from zero. One and two thirds of a stop from zero. I'm going to force it to be white. With a, with a D200, it was two stops, six clicks. With a D3, I find three to four clicks up. One, and st one stop or one and a third stop. It varies. You have to find, your own, find it for your own camera. So then what I do is, meter off the white. If I just zero my needle, it'll be gray, it'll be ugly. I take it uh, five clicks up from zero. One and two thirds. I look at my my metering display in the middle. Just looking at the white, nothing else. You're so, changing stops, you're not changing your, your, no, no, no. You, this isn't manual metering mode on my camera. I can change shutter speed, aperture, or ISO. Yeah, I have to. I have to change something. But I take my histogram, I, I meter, and I take it five clicks up from zero. I take a test shot. My histogram dips right in the corner. A, it all comes together. If I'd had a handheld meter there, it would have told me the same exposure. So I meter off the white, place it on my histogram, now I can pull back. My exposure will be consistent regardless of my composition. The amount of 
bright areas there in the sky will now not affect my exposure. Does that make sense? That's why I shoot in manual mode on my camera, because I can now kneel down in front of an ultra wide angle lens shooting up against the sky. I can pull wider, I can do, I can design something for the album where she's in the one part of the frame and I have the other part of the frame which is just blown out negative space in the album. You can, you can now start playing around with the composition without affecting your basic exposure metering because you have fixed it in manual metering mode by exposing for your subject, by exposing for the brightest part of your subject using a specific metering, checking with your histogram so it all comes together. It may be obvious, uh, I'm sorry, but would you also just as easily decide what you want your aperture to be, your dress stop to be, and then go and use a handheld meter, a meter for the dress, not your camera? I, I could use a handheld meter here. Like it's more clutter. I get there as fast using my histogram. Okay. So just stand right there, and I just do a quick touch shot of a dress and go, hey, cool. Boom. It all comes together in the same, same place. OK, we have one minute left. Let's do it. Mixing flash with tungsten light. Flash, 5400 Kelvin. It's a very blue light. Tungsten, very warm, 3000 Kelvin, 2800 Kelvin, somewhere there. This disparate white balance can cause two kinds of problems. So let's say my subject here is in shade. The background is lit by tungsten light. I bounce flash. If my white balance is correct for him, lit by flash, my background will now become that deep, murky orange. If you like it, that's cool. If you don't, I don't, you gel your flash. You gel your flash, you bring your flash white balance on top of or, or very close to tungsten. But where there's a real problem is when your subject is partly lit by tungsten, partly lit by flash. <coughs> then it becomes a very difficult mix between the blue light and the orange light. The next photograph is not mine. I found it on the internet and I'll explain the problem very well. <laughs> okay, heavy tungsten spotlight over him. It's all orange, it's ugly. Wherever he was lit by direct flash, you have a very blue tint. That is how bad it can look. <coughs> the simplest way around it, let me move on. Simplest way around it, stick a piece of gel on it. Get it from B&H. The sheet is $7. It costs you pretty much nothing. Cut it, stick it on top. Now you bring your flash white balance either to 2900 Kelvin, uh, 3800 Kelvin with a half gel, or you can bring it right on top of tungsten with 2900 Kelvin. So if I want to blend my flash very closely to the available light, I go to full CTS. Half CTS if I want to bring it close, but I still want some warmth in the background. So I work with a half CTS as kind of my default. Stick it on. It's that simple. It'll solve so many of your flash problems indoors. If you have a weird colored balance and people look bluish and all that, this will fix that problem. So here I have the model stand under a spotlight. That is ugly lighting. Bounce flash off a wall into her gel for tungsten. There it is. If I take that gel off, in other words, I now have tungsten spotlight and blue flash, it looks like this. I start getting a blue tint around her mouth, eyes. It just doesn't look pleasant. Putting that gel on cleans it up immediately. Ideally, though, I'd move her away from that and just bounce flash and clean it up completely. But sticking that piece of gel on fixes up a lot of my problems. Groom waiting for the bride, heavy tungsten spotlight over him, bounce flash into the side with a piece of black foam. There's no direct flash on him. Gelled my flash with a full CTS gel. So I've got tungsten flash, a uh, tungsten light, a tungsten flash. It's all evenly balanced. Light comes in, cleans up his features. Other nice thing with this piece of black foam underneath, it blocks light from hitting people in the face. So I didn't see any of the grandmother's retinas in the front row. It's all in the ceiling. So I'm that rare thing, a very polite wedding photographer. I kid, I kid. Okay. All kinds of tungsten lights, video light, it's all a very warm color spectrum. Uh, tungsten gel flash, you join them. Here's a nice example. Look at all these details here. There's lilac tones, purple tones, reds, greens, oranges, it's all there. If I used flash white balance, it'll all be lost 
as a murky tungsten grunge orange. But by gelling my flash, I join that color spectrum. Now I see the colors as they actually appeared at the time. I get to see the different hues and colors there. Here I used a half CTS gel. I want to retain some of the warmth in the background so I didn't completely correct for my flash. There we go. <coughs> Okay, the question is what white balance do I use? You use your predominant white balance. What is your major source of light? If I slap a piece of gel on a full CTS, I change it to 2800 Kelvin or 2900 Kelvin, or change it to tungsten. Put a half CTS on, I go to 3800 Kelvin. But I still shoot in raw because I'm bouncing off all other kinds of surfaces. So the colors will change. It needs to be corrected a little bit. You can't put an auto white balance because most cameras, if you put an auto white balance and it senses the speed light, defaults to a flash white balance. So it, it makes your white balance very warm, whereas your white balance should be at 2800 Kelvin. So your photographs will come out orange and you'll have to do a major correction in RAW, which is not a problem, but I find it easier for me to judge my exposure on the back of my camera if my white balance is correct. And I can go, okay, we're close, or we're there. I don't do custom white balances. The hold, hold that thought. We are four slides away from being done, and then we can finish up. The people that need to leave and need to catch a bus can leave, or we can linger a little bit for the last few questions. Custom white balances, hold that thought. We'll come back to tungsten light. OK. Bounce my flash here, tungsten white balance. Now, here's the thing. You can see it here. My white balance is tungsten because I have a tungsten gel on. As the light recedes to the background, it becomes more tungsten light. It doesn't fade from flash white balance to tungsten. It doesn't change as it changes the background. There's never an uneasy mix between the two. It changes from a tungsten white balance, fades out to a tungsten white balance. So I have a more even white balance through the picture as the light from my flash recedes. Bounce flash, cleans it up, looks great. That's what the ambient light was. And this is for the video light. So now there's another step. If you do want to play around with video lights, a tungsten light that videographers use, it'll give you this kind of effect, a very spotlit effect, very dramatic, very Hollywood lighting. It looks like that. There's a very dramatic fall from the light. I think that looks great. That looks great too. You can play around with it. And by gelling my flash for tungsten, I can pull my flash compensation down and just clean up a little bit of the light and use the videographer's light. So quite often I use shoot alongside the videographer and just use a little bit of tungsten gelled flash with this tungsten light. So you don't have to fight with your videographer more than you need to. We can get along. And there it is, last photograph. Brian and Groom, I gelled for tungsten. The background is now warm without being a deep orange. It all comes together. And finally, on my website, there's a whole bunch of information. There's something like 400 pages of articles. I answer, I really try and answer each question that I can get. There's a lot of interaction with everybody on my blog. So if you have questions, join me over there, ask me questions. I will answer. Thank you for being here.